So Revelation 2, 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamon write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Wow, this, this third letter, good morning, Ray. This, uh, this letter here, the third letter, is addressed to the church of Pergamum. So remember, we've been talking about this. And here's our little map. And once again, I'm going to try to do this backwards, right? You have uh, the Isle of, right? There you go, Patmos, right? So, so here you go. That's where John's writing from. And you see the different churches. And he starts with Ephesus. He's moving to Smyrna. And now we are up here in Pergamum. Okay, it's so hard doing that backwards. Um, and, and so he's writing to these physical churches, real churches in a real time about what's going on in their churches and using these these words from Jesus, writing these letters to each one. And it had a this group, this area of Pergamum had a very long history. Seems like a lot of these churches have, right, as we've looked into them. And it had a long history. And it in the next 200 years that were up and coming, it would grow to bigger fame. This church was 65 miles north of Smyrna, and it was what was called a um, provincial capital, meaning it was given all the rights. So uh, it was given all the Roman rights of citizenship and all of that. Good morning, mom and dad. So in other words, there was some war or something that happened in this area and Pergamum was one of the first ones to turn to the Roman side and to fight in such a way that they earned an honor to be the capital, which this meant that they could execute people without ever going to Rome, without ever having an emissary come from Rome to approve the execution. They had all the rights as if they were Rome itself. This was a big deal. So you can hear in that. They sold out to the empire, right? They sold out to the Caesar. It was a providential capital. Pergamon means marriage. It, this church that they were writing to was a clear marriage or, or even compromise, if you will, between the church and the world, the church and the state, the church and the, the world around them. It begins with this phrase, the words of him who has the sharp, two-edged sword. This picture of the one with the double-edged sword. Greek had two words for sword, describing first a small sword or a large sword. The small sword being what the Roman soldiers would normally carry around. It was a just a scabbard sword, you know, just a Maybe maybe three feet long, right? It was really easy to handle. They could handle it with one hand, right? Um, but then you had these other ones, and almost you could picture the the European that we see in like Braveheart, the double-edged sword, the, the broad sword. It was a two-handled sword, sometimes five and six feet tall. And you could you had to hold two hands to wield the sword, which meant that you were unguarded, right? You didn't have a shield. Good morning, Pat. And so he's describing God's sword, the, the Lord's sword, as a double-edged sword. Let's put it this way. Don't fear the sword of the Romans. Don't fear the sword of this world because God has a larger two-edged sword that will take them out. Right? That's kind of a picture that we can get here as believers 
the sword was the word of God. Deuteronomy 32, 39, 41, and 42 all talk about a sharp two-edged sword. Hosea 6, 1 then says that death brings to life. The wound did I will heal. It's the promise of God. And so God will convict you. God might even wound you, right? But he will always heal you. The hard times come, James says, so that we are made stronger and wiser in our faith. Those trials and testings that we are going through at times, they seem like they put wounds to us. We might go through some traumatic experiences to get to where God wants us to be, to be able to use our misery for God's glory, right? Uh, use our pain. Remember, pain is is is, is going to happen, but misery is optional, right? We kind of mentioned that on Sunday briefly. You know, there was one theologian who said a little bit of religion will make you miserable, but a whole lot of religion will make you happy, <laughs> will make you joyful. Just a little bit of religion, I mean, that's going to challenge you. That's going to convict you. It might even wound you because, well, how dare you tell me that I'm living in sin? How, how dare you tell me that I'm not perfect? How dare you, right? And, and so a little bit of religion might wound us. But God is taking those wounding and he's promised that he will heal us. Good morning, Carla. And so we must lean in. When, when God hits a sore spot, when God hits that soft spot of our, uh, you know, the, that, that little bit, you know, you, you ever have like a sibling that like to pinch you right here? It's so tender and sore and they barely got a pinch right there on that bottom of your arm and it hurts so bad, right? When God hits those sore spots of our lives, we don't run away. We lean in to listen to what he is teaching us because even though it wounds, he will heal us, he's promised. Chapter 19 and 20 is going to discuss this double-edged sword even more so, and we'll get to that when we get there. But God's word, if you will, it cuts both ways. It challenges us both ways. It is going to comfort and it's going to convict. It will comfort, bring comfort to the believer, assurance to the believer. It'll also convict. It'll convict the wayward sinner. It'll convict the backsliding Christian. It'll convict the Christian who, well, I've been saved, but I don't want to grow. I don't want to grow deeper. I'm okay with where I'm at. I'm happy with where I'm at. I'm comfortable in my sin. I'm comfortable with the chains that I'm holding on to. God's sword will cut both ways in comfort and conviction. Comfort to the persecuted church and conviction to the compromising church. This church has, com has compromised. His words of comfort were, I know where you dwell. That almost sounds scary, doesn't it? But no, he's, he's saying, I know where you're at. I know where you're living. I, I know what you are under. I know what's going on in your city. He goes, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Wow, that's pretty big. He's saying Satan's throne. Well, it's a providential capital for one, right? But it's also a stronghold of Satan in that area. And he reminds them that Christ is on the throne and we must submit all things to him. Yet God's word will call out these strongholds. In Pergamon, there were three different temples in this city, Satan's strongholds. The first one was a temple to a snake god, a snake god of all snakes. In fact, in this temple, it makes me think of Indiana Jones, snakes. Why did it have to be snakes, right? Um, but in this snake temple to this snake god, snakes were crawling all over the place. And the belief was if one were to touch you, it would heal you. Wow. Wow. I'm glad we don't worship it to a snake god, right? I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm okay with snakes. I grew up around boa constrictors and stuff, and my brother would throw them on my shoulders. And, you know, of course, when they were shedding, and so they're tightening themselves up all around you, you know, that type of thing. That was that was just who my brother was. And, you know, I dealt with that, uh, um, sort of. I still talk to a psychologist about it. But, you know, the, the temple to the snake god, and if a snake touches you, you're healed. And that was one of their strongholds to Satan. Another one was they had a temple to the god Zeus. They worshiped Zeus there in Pergamon. And the third one was a temple. Well, it was a temple to the emperor worship, like we talked about yesterday, of worshiping Caesar. 
verse 13 reminds us of this name Antipas. Well, I mean, we don't, you don't know who Antipas is, right? I mean, he's not in other places. And, and so it, it takes some church history to know who Antipas was. Antipas, the, the scripture says the only thing you really need to know. I mean, you don't have to be a historian to understand everything about scripture. Antipas, right? It says Antipas in verse 13, uh, it, it goes, um, to, in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Okay, that's that's good enough. You get the picture of Antipas, but let me give you a little more of the history. So Antipas, his name meant against everyone, right? That's what they deemed him as in the world, because it seemed like he was against everyone, because he was against these temples. He was one of the first converts of Jesus that lived in this area, and he was killed by a mob because he was speaking out against the worship to this snake god. So they killed him. He was a real person, not imaginary. And, and yet in his story, in his account, we can find it represented even in church. People that were giving in and compromising. And he was standing seemingly against everyone. There was a, another um, church father that would come later, Athanasius, and Athanasius, who, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't really understand atonement and some things like that, um, which is a big theological word. If you don't get it, it's okay. Um, you know, but it's what God does on the cross, the blood of Jesus, how it saves us, that saving grace, the work of Jesus on the cross, and how it changes us, saves us, found us, redeems us, all of that, um, those works. Atonement is at, at one with Jesus, right? At one with God the Father, that relationship restored. And Athanasius at many times, um, well, he, he said it's, it's Athanasius against the world. Because there were times where even the church was against Athanasius. Because somebody would be in ruling that was more political than they were religious, and they would ex exile him. And he came back and forth. I mean, it's, his journey was crazy. And sometimes it feels like, as believers, it's you against the world. You get saved and your family's not. It's you against your family. You get saved and your friends don't understand it. It's you against your friends. Sometimes it feels lonely. And God goes, I see you. I know where you live. I'm with you. This double-edged sword is protecting you. Because God's word is a promise to us. Verse 17, the promise is to the one who overcomes. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. To the one who conquers or overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. To the one who overcomes, hidden manna to eat. Hidden manna, that food that we get to feast upon, that food that is, is well, helps us to be dedicated to God, the bread of life that feeds not just our physical bodies, but nourishes our soul. When you feel weak and you feel weary, maybe it's because you're not abiding, practicing abiding prayer. I spent some time yesterday in the sanctuary praying over over some stuff that was taking place yesterday, and um, for 45 minutes, uh, and that's not a pat on my back, um, it, 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 but I had some worship music playing on my phone, and I might have only prayed audibly for five or 10 minutes of that 45 minutes. Some of the time was walking through the sanctuary. Sometimes I was laying with my head on the cushion to the altar, holding on to the altar, right? Um, it, it was just times of abiding in God's presence, deeply just being with him. That's the bread of life that feeds our soul. My heart rate was at 120 before. And it had been there for about 15 minutes because of just the stress, the anxieties, and that prayer time brought it back down into the 80s where it should have been, right? Abiding prayer changes us. It centers us, focuses on him. We're taking in that bread of life that feeds our soul. He then mentions this white stone. Well, what's a white stone? I mean, that, that just seems weird. 
right? Well, well the opposite of it's a black stone. So, okay, I, I get that. So there's two different things we can see here. One, in ancient days, there were two different things that came from this. One w w had to do with the, uh, um, the trials. When you were in the court system, actually, I could say three things because one was voting. You would vote. A yes vote was a white stone. A no vote was a black stone, okay? When you were in the court system, you would be given a white stone, a white ball, a white pebble, if you were acquitted, and a black stone, a black ball, a black pebble, if you were found guilty, right? Same thing would happen in the secret societies that were prevalent in this area. Now, there are some that the secret societies happened later. So this illustration works a lot better in the judicial system because we know that was taking place when John wrote this. But later on, we would see these this idea in these secret societies that if you were accepted, you would be given a white ball or a white, actually, they, you know, they called it a white ball. And this white ball allowed you to purchase things, to trade things. You remember yesterday, right? It, it was your mark that allowed you to be in society. If you were not accepted into this secret society, you were given a black ball. Ever heard about somebody being blackballed? Oh, like mailed now, right? But that was that idea, blackballed wasn't a racial thing. It was a true thing, right? They were given this ball that meant that they were rejected and they couldn't buy food. They couldn't trade. They couldn't be a part of some working places and homes. It was a mark. And then it tells us that they will, we, the overcomers, will receive a new name. There's an old hymn. I've got a new name written down in glory. Oh, yes, it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine, right? Um, New name. That name references character traits, right? Names referred to a character. When we saw Jesus and his name shall be Emmanuel, well, it didn't mean that his name was Emmanuel. It meant his character was God with us. Emmanuel. Names referred to character traits in this culture. Antipas was a faithful witness, just like Jesus. He was the one who stood against everyone. And yet he was faithful. He was a faithful witness like Jesus. He changed, Jesus changes our character and the Holy Spirit continues to make us more and more like Jesus. If we are not abiding in, in prayer and being in God's presence, we aren't being made more and more like Jesus. We can stop growing. We can grow calloused and lethargic. And we need that re-infilling of the Holy Spirit, that renewal. So as to be his faithful witnesses, our new name written on that stone. Well, we know one new name we have, and it's called Christians. His name is upon us as Christians. He has placed his name on us, his character of Jesus Christ, of Christ followers. Isaiah 62, 2, you shall be called by a new name. Isaiah 65, 15, you shall have my name. Revelation 19, 12, Jesus has a new name as well, and our name is his name. It comes from who he is, his character. That old is gone. The new has come. When our Eyes and our mind, our heart, our will, our emotions are focused on Jesus. He is changing who we are slowly by slowly. Some of us, it happens overnight, like Saul. Wouldn't we all love that? To be instantly changed within a matter of three days. <laughs> um, from persecutor to staunch, passionate believer. But even then, he went to Tarsus for three years to learn and to grow before ever preaching doesn't happen overnight, folks. We grow daily to be more and more like him, taking on his character, the character of Jesus Christ, to be more loving, more lovable. We are to operate under his name. This means we must show the change in our attitudes and our actions by taking captive every rebellious thought, right? And that comes with this new name. 
And God's word will also convict. It will convict them. And, and he gives these examples, two, two examples primarily that he gives here. And one is Balaam. Balaam was a, an account in Numbers, Numbers 22 to 24. And maybe you know the story of Balaam's donkey. And sometimes I like to say, if God can speak through a donkey, he can speak through me, right? Um, Balaam's donkey. But Balaam, it says, was a prophet of the Most High God. And he was hired by, uh, by this king to curse the Israelites. We don't always talk about the whole story, right? He was called to curse, but ends up blessing them. But then a couple chapters later, we see that his name is among those who were killed in a rebellion and pure. You see, he called the Israelites to feast with others. It was a compromise to the things of what God had told them and a turning away from God. His was a curse of compromise. The church of Jesus Christ has never been crushed from without, but always from within, by compromise, by division, by disunity, by quarreling and griping. Denominations give in. Pastors trained at some universities, right? And they are taught these strange and unusual almost heretical things, and they begin to compromise their beliefs. The second thing they are challenged with was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We've talked about them too, right? The Nicolaitans, it was lawlessness, perversion of grace to make it a license to sin because, well, I'm saved spiritually and my flesh doesn't matter, so I can do whatever I want in the flesh. It's not becoming more like Christ. It's not changing my attitudes and actions. Do you see how that seeps into the church even yet today? But we are called to holiness. The revival we need is a revival of holiness, holy living. Not so that we can go around with our noses stuck up in the air like we're perfect. But to point people to a perfect God. It was a sin of lawlessness that nothing you do will forfeit your salvation. That lifestyle has nothing to do with your faith. So live it up. They practiced sexual orgies, free love, all kinds of stuff in the midst of their services. So here's the challenge. When compromise, cre compromise creeps into our lives, my life, your life, our homes, our churches, we must repent. We must repent. We must seek the face of God in forgiveness. We must turn from our wicked ways. You know, there's a, a verse, chapter 3, verse 20 here of Revelations, and, and, and you may have heard it, right? We talk about it when it comes to salvation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, uh, you know, I will come in, right? And it's we use it as a message of salvation, but here's the thing. God was standing at the heart of the church of Laodicea standing at the heart of the believer. He's going, no, oh, you say you love me. You say you believe me. You say you're called by my name, but I can't even get in. Huh. When compromise seeps into our lives before we know it, we've given up things. We compromise in our devotions. We compromise into the things we allow into our house. Dare I say, I've known people who were part of church, and then Halloween comes around, and they open themselves up to things in Halloween, and then they wonder why it seems like there is darkness and oppression following them, and we don't see them for months on end in church. May we be careful. Same thing with movies. Same thing with TV. I'm not saying get rid of your TV. But I would say and challenge maybe. You know, today is Fat Tuesday. Fat Tuesday. Tomorrow, Ash Wednesday, starts Lent. It was this concept that they would take the palm branches from the year before that were used to praise Jesus, and they would take them, burn them, 
And that was the ash that we would put on our heads as a cross and in the liturgical style church to remind us one day we were praising and the next we were cursing. Those that said, he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, were soon saying, crucify him. To set us into this 40 days of Lent, of a, a fasting of something, so as to turn more to God. And maybe for that 40 days of fasting, you need to give up TV, movies, Maybe. If every night you find yourself watching three and four and five hours worth of TV, maybe you need to give it up. Maybe you need to give up the news. If for 40 days and you were spending that time with Christ, would that not change you? When compromise seeps in, It's a slow fade of turning away and turning our backs. And we don't even know it sometimes until we've already done it. But here's hope. If my people will call on my name and humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven and heal them. If my people. So God, I, I do pray that we would be those that know that even in the darkness that we can live solid for you and not allow these compromises in. These things that seek more of me, more of my flesh, more of my wants, desires, attitudes, than understanding who you are and seeking to have my attitudes and actions changed by you through your Holy Spirit to be more like your son, more loving and more lovable. And so God, we give our lives over to you even yet today. Even those as believers, we again, we repent of the times of our disposition, our attitudes that have gotten in the way that have maybe not been the most Christ-like, the most loving. God, we, allow, uh, we, we ask for forgiveness for the times that we allow things into our lives that should not be, that you've clearly told us are taking precedence over you and causing fear, like things like Halloween and the scary movies and stuff that can create anxieties and fear. Lord, may we flee from them. Flee from the devil, not embrace him. Lord, we need your help and your guidance and your conviction today. May we lean into that conviction and not run away from it. Because there is always greater joy on that other side of that conviction. So Lord, I thank you for those times where you give us that comfort and conviction, that comfort and that challenge to grow deeper and deeper with you. May we be obedient and listen for your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, go in peace, and I pray you have a great rest of the afternoon.